On October 23, 2012, Todd Smith, who was 44 at the time, reported his 30-year-old wife, Katrina, as missing to the police in Illinois. He claimed she had gone shopping and hadn't come back. This triggered a desperate search for Katrina, during which Todd appeared on television daily, making heartfelt appeals for her to return. I just want her to come home or call or let us know she's safe. Katrina, please, he pleaded. The last message Todd sent to Katrina before her disappearance was a text saying, sweet dreams, I love you. However, when Katrina's abandoned car was discovered and her body was found three weeks later, the truth about Todd began to surface. It turned out that his narrative was fabricated, and as the investigation progressed, he was eventually convicted of murdering his wife. Todd Smith was sentenced to 55 years in prison for the crime. Katrina Edlin was born on July 16, 1982. She was the youngest child of her mom, Vicky. Katrina had an older brother named Chad and a younger sister named Miranda. Miranda really looked up to Katrina when they were kids. She would often try on Katrina's clothes and use her makeup because she admired her so much and wanted to be just like her. As they grew up, Miranda and Katrina became very close, more like best friends than sisters. When Katrina was young, her parents split up and she stayed with her mom. She grew up in a small town in Illinois. People who knew Katrina thought of her as kind and fun-loving. She loved the holiday season a lot and enjoyed giving funny, playful gifts to her friends and family. Katrina was generally a very happy person and was deeply involved in her church. She always wanted to help others and was ready to spend time with anyone who needed it. Even though she was happy, Katrina was also looking for love. She thought she found it when she met Todd Smith at a bar when she was 20. Todd was a successful financial planner with his own business, and he worked from home. He also had three daughters. Katrina and Todd really clicked despite their differences, and his flexible job meant they could travel a lot together. Three years later, Todd proposed to Katrina, and she was thrilled. They planned a small wedding in a local park, and Katrina was excited about their future together. She loved Todd's daughters and looked forward to a bright future with him. Katrina's family, including her mom, Vicky, and her siblings, Chad and Miranda, really liked Todd. They thought he was a great guy and trusted him with Katrina, believing they were a perfect match. On October 20th, 2012, Katrina, who was then 30 years old, called her mom, Vicky, to say she was house sitting for a friend. She told her mom during the call that she would come over for dinner on October 24th, and she had some news to share with her then. Vicky had a feeling that something was up, but she couldn't pinpoint what it might be. Before they ended their phone call, Vicky promised to make Katrina's favorite meal, chicken and dumplings, the next time they saw each other. Unfortunately, she would never get the chance to keep that promise. A few days after their conversation, Katrina went missing and Vicky never saw her daughter again. At 5 p.m. on October 23rd, Todd Smith, Katrina's husband, called 911 to report her missing. He told the dispatcher that Katrina was house-sitting for a friend and that he hadn't been able to get in touch with her for several hours. When he checked the house, he found it empty. Katrina's disappearance worried her siblings too. Chad, her brother, was in Oklahoma training with the U.S. Army at the time. As soon as he heard what happened, he flew back to Illinois to help look for his sister. That same evening, a local resident noticed an abandoned vehicle near the Rock River. The car wasn't parked properly. It was off to the side as though someone had left it there in a rush. When the police investigated the car, they discovered it was registered to Katrina. However, there was no sign of any struggle or of Katrina herself inside the vehicle. When Vicky learned that her daughter's car had been found abandoned in a ditch on the side of a road in an area unfamiliar to Katrina, her heart sank. She was convinced something terrible had happened. 
The only explanation that made sense to her was that someone had taken Katrina and left her car there. After finding the car, the authorities officially classified Katrina as a missing person and intensified the search for her. At 11 p.m. on October 12th, police brought Todd Smith for questioning. Todd told the detective that he last saw Katrina on October 22nd when she briefly came home to do laundry in preparation for a big job interview the next day. While the laundry was running, Todd said, Katrina went out to the mall to buy something and returned home around 8.30 p.m. But soon after, she left the house again, and that was the last time Todd saw her. Todd mentioned that Katrina had one last errand to run before she would return home. She was currently house-sitting for a friend. The day after she was officially listed as missing, Todd Smith went to the media to make a heartfelt plea for his wife's safe return. During this emotional moment, Todd couldn't hold back his tears as he expressed his desperate hope to find Katrina. He urged anyone with any information about her whereabouts to come forward and help. I just wanted to come home or call her, let us know that she's safe. As time went on, the search efforts for Katrina grew more intense. Search teams made up of police officers and volunteers worked tirelessly. They focused their search on a park close to where Katrina's car had been found abandoned, hoping to find any clues or evidence that might explain her disappearance. When Chad, Katrina's brother, arrived in Illinois from his army training in Oklahoma, he met up with the search teams at the park. Using his military skills, Chad organized the search effort effectively. He mapped out the search areas and divided the volunteers into teams, ensuring a thorough search was conducted. The search teams, alongside search dogs, aligned themselves in a straight line to comb through the park methodically. This technique helped them cover more ground and made sure no potential evidence was overlooked. Meanwhile, Katrina's mother, Vicky, was also doing her part by spreading awareness about her daughter's disappearance. She hung up missing person flyers all around the town, at gas stations, convenience stores, and on lampposts. Her main goal was to make as many people as possible aware of Katrina's situation. However, the overwhelming grief and the fear of possibly finding her daughter's body prevented Vicky from joining the physical search. During this tough time, Todd remained visibly distressed. Chad supported him, urging him to keep his strength as they needed to stay focused on finding Katrina. Chad was a constant source of support for his brother-in-law, empathizing deeply with his pain. The search led to a small breakthrough when an officer found Katrina's purse near where her car was abandoned. Continuing the search further down the road from the car, the officer found additional personal items that belonged to Katrina, adding more pieces to the puzzle of her mysterious disappearance. Among the items found were Katrina's cell phone and towels that seemed to have been used to clean up blood. This indicated that someone had been discarding Katrina's belongings as they moved away from where her car was abandoned. At this point, the police didn't have any leads on Katrina's whereabouts but they suspected that something terrible had happened to her. The items discovered on the side of the road were sent to a crime lab for analysis, and the police were anxiously waiting for the results to help them in their investigation. Meanwhile, they started to look into Katrina's personal life for any clues that might explain her sudden disappearance. The investigation aimed to cover all aspects of her life, including checking if she had any relationships outside her marriage, any involvement in gambling or drugs, in understanding her daily routines. They interviewed Katrina's friends and family extensively, all of whom consistently described her as a kind-hearted and responsible person who always took her responsibilities seriously and steered clear of any questionable activities. They emphasized her dedication to her work and her strong work ethic, stating that she showed no signs of addictive behaviors or irresponsibility. During the ongoing search for Katrina, a potentially significant tip came in from a woman. She reported seeing a blue vehicle, similar to Katrina's, stopped on a bridge over the Rock River on the night Katrina disappeared. The car's trunk was open, and she saw someone kneeling behind it. However, she couldn't provide specific details about the person she saw. This tip led the police to consider the possibility that Katrina might have been thrown into the river but they still lack solid evidence to confirm any foul play. As the investigation deepened, 
The police also had to consider everyone close to Katrina, including her husband, Todd, despite reports of a happy marriage. The possibility of undisclosed conflicts or secrets within the marriage made Todd a person of interest. The ongoing investigation was challenging, but the police were committed to uncovering the truth. They eventually gathered information that led them to a suspect, which marked a crucial turn in the case. The police found out about a local teenager who seemed to have an unhealthy fixation with Katrina. Earlier in the year, Katrina had told her friends about a teenage boy from her church who had been watching her through her bedroom window, which made her very uneasy. The boy's unsettling behavior eventually stopped when he went away to college, but the police suspected that he might have come back and started following Katrina again. They decided to put a lot of effort into tracking him down. Three days into their search, Katrina's cell phone, which had been sent to the crime lab, turned out to be a key source of information. The phone held a lot of details like her texts, call logs, photos, videos, and even GPS data. This data helped the police get a better idea of what Katrina had been doing recently. For example, they found out that she was involved in a secret romantic relationship with a coworker named Guy Gabriel. Katrina and Guy had started off as casual acquaintances after meeting one night after work, but their relationship grew into something more. However, when the police looked into Guy Gabriel's background, they found he had a history of domestic violence. They also found texts from Guy demanding that Katrina leave her husband for him. Given his violent past and the demanding texts, Guy Gabriel quickly became the main suspect in Katrina's disappearance. The police considered the possibility that he could have harmed Katrina in anger over her not leaving her husband. When Katrina's family learned about her affair, they were stunned. Everyone had always seen Katrina and her husband as a perfect, happy couple. The revelation of her affair left them shocked and deeply upset. Todd, who had been unaware of the affair until the investigation brought it to light, was devastated by the news of his wife's betrayal. Guy Gabriel was called in for a formal interview at the police station regarding Katrina's disappearance. During the interview, he appeared nervous, but did admit to having an affair with Katrina. Guy Gabriel insisted that he had nothing to do with Katrina's disappearance. He claimed he was at work the entire night she went missing. As the police continued to investigate Katrina's relationship with Guy, they uncovered an incident from two weeks prior to her disappearance. During lunch at the auto shop where Katrina and Guy worked, a black Volkswagen Jetta sped through the parking lot. A masked driver tossed a stack of flyers from the car's open sunroof right where the workers were gathered. These flyers, which landed all around them, contained negative remarks about Katrina and Guy's relationship. No one at the scene could identify the driver of the car. Meanwhile, Katrina's hairstylist shared that Katrina had been feeling increasingly unsafe. Katrina had even talked about buying a gun for protection, worried that someone was following her. She had also visited a store to check if her phone had been tampered with or had a tracking device installed. At the police garage, crime scene investigators examined Katrina's car. They used a chemical called luminol, which lights up in the presence of blood, revealing significant blood stains in the trunk and on the front seat of her car. This discovery heightened their concerns. Further examination of the undercarriage revealed a GPS tracker. Tests confirmed that the blood in the car was indeed Katrina's. Given the amount of blood found, the police began to fear the worst, that Katrina might not be alive. 18 days after her disappearance, an off-duty fireman fishing on Rock River spotted what he initially thought was a log. Upon closer inspection, he realized it was actually a body. The fire department was called to retrieve it. When they pulled it from the water, they found it was a female body, badly decomposed. At that point, it was hard to tell if it was Katrina or not. The discovery was distressing, and the investigation continued to unravel the mystery surrounding her disappearance. The body was taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy to find out how she died. Dental records were used to identify the remains. A dental expert compared the teeth from the body with Katrina Smith's dental records and confirmed that the body was indeed Katrina's. 
The autopsy showed that Katrina died from blunt force trauma to the head. When Katrina's family found out that her body had been discovered and that she had been killed by a blow to the head, they were heartbroken. They cried as they struggled to accept the terrible news. The thought of Katrina being violently attacked was particularly hard for her mother. Meanwhile, the police questioned the teenager who had been suspected of stalking Katrina, but cleared him as a suspect after verifying his alibi. He had been on his college campus when Katrina disappeared and was killed. The investigation then focused on Guy Gabriel, Katrina's boyfriend outside her marriage. Guy told the police he had been at work the night Katrina went missing. His managers confirmed this with a time card and co-workers said they saw him there, which supported his alibi. With this information, the police ruled out Guy Gabriel as a suspect in Katrina's disappearance and murder. Even though Guy was no longer a suspect, the police asked him for any insights on who might have wanted to harm Katrina. Guy mentioned that Katrina's husband, Todd, had been controlling, and he had encouraged Katrina to leave Todd because of it. He suggested that Todd's behavior might have escalated to physical violence. As the police looked more into Katrina's relationship with Todd Smith, they uncovered several troubling details. They learned that Katrina had been considering a divorce and had even met with a divorce attorney the day before she disappeared. Despite Katrina telling people she was house-sitting at a friend's condo, it turned out she had moved there because she and Todd had separated. These discoveries led the police to scrutinize Todd's involvement more closely as they continued to piece together the events leading to Katrina's tragic death. After investigating further and interviewing various people, the police began to suspect that Todd was responsible for the mysterious incident involving flyers at Katrina's workplace. This suspicion increased when they discovered that Todd had test-driven a black Jetta, the same type and color of car used during the flyer incident around the same time the incident occurred. When the police informed Katrina's family that Todd was not only the prime suspect in her murder, but also already in custody, the family was utterly shocked and in disbelief. They had always seen Todd as more than just an in-law. They had loved and respected him deeply. The news devastated everyone, especially Katrina's mother, Vicky. The thought that her son-in-law could be responsible for her daughter's murder was overwhelming and made her physically ill. Vicky had always trusted Todd completely, and the idea that he could commit such a heinous crime was something she had never considered. During their investigation, the police also learned about Todd's financial troubles. His investment company was facing legal issues, and with Todd out of work, Katrina had become the family's main income provider. The officers theorized that Todd might have contemplated murdering Katrina to gain access to her financial assets especially if she were to leave him and take her earnings with her. In pursuit of evidence, the police secured a search warrant for the home Todd and Katrina shared. During the search, investigators found a baseball bat hidden in a corner of the garage. They noticed blood traces on the bat, which led them to believe it might have been the weapon used to inflict the blunt force trauma that killed Katrina. To confirm their suspicions, the investigators conducted a DNA test on the bat. The results confirmed that the blood was indeed Katrina's, linking the bat directly to her murder. Additionally, during the search, investigators found a large area under the car that appeared to have been meticulously cleaned. Further testing revealed that bloodstains under the vehicle matched Katrina's DNA profile, adding more evidence to the case against Todd. 30 days after Katrina Smith's murder, her husband, Todd Smith, was arrested and charged with the crime. This arrest brought some relief to her grieving family. Todd's trial began on January 11, 2017. During the trial, the prosecution presented a detailed account of the events surrounding Katrina's murder. The prosecution started by highlighting that Katrina had recently consulted a divorce attorney, pointing to significant marital issues. They suggested that this meeting was a clear sign of a deeply troubled relationship. According to the prosecution, on the night of the murder, Katrina visited Todd's house to do laundry in preparation for a job interview scheduled for the next morning. During this visit, she allegedly informed Todd that she wanted to end their marriage. The state argued that this conversation triggered Todd, leading him to a violent outburst.
They claimed that while Katrina was in the garage, Todd, overcome with anger, attacked her with a baseball bat, beating her to death. After killing Katrina, Todd was accused of putting her body in the trunk of her car, driving to a secluded area near Rock River, and throwing her body off a bridge. Following this, he supposedly abandoned her car by the roadside, walked home, and attempted to eliminate any physical evidence by disposing of her cell phone and the bloody towels used in the cleanup. The jury, convinced by the evidence presented, found Todd guilty of murdering Katrina. He was subsequently sentenced to 55 years in prison. He still maintains his innocence. Katrina's mom said in court, all you had to do was walk away and let Katrina live the life she deserved. But out of greed and jealousy and rage, you chose to take her precious life. And with that, we end today's story of the crime storyteller. Don't forget to subscribe and hit like if you appreciate my work. Until next time.